the History Show with Mars Duncan. Good evening and welcome to The History Show on RTE Radio 1. On this week's programme... If you're trying to create a Dáil counterstate, these are ideal circumstances in which to do this. As we return for a new season, tonight we present the first in a special series on the Irish War of Independence. It took post-revolutionary Ireland over 40 years to even come close to the number of women who were involved. For the next few months, we'll be exploring different aspects of the conflict, from the meeting of the First Dáil in January 1919 to the signing of the Treaty in December 1921. The more that the British government ups repression, the more the Republicans can present a united front because it's clear there is a common enemy. Tonight's programme, The Gathering Storm. How the war began with early ambushes, attacks on RIC barracks and skirmishes. And how Dáil Éireann, the breakaway government, set about building and financing the new Irish Republic. I'll be joined throughout this programme by three guests. Dr Brian Hanley is an historian and author. Dr Heather Laird is a lecturer in the School of English at University College Cork and the author of the 2018 book Commemoration. And Dr Dahio Koran is a lecturer in history in the School of History and Geography at Dublin City University. And he's also co-editor with Marion Lyons of the County by County Irish Revolution series published by Four Courts Press. You're all very welcome indeed. Brian, you were with us earlier this year for our programme marking the 100th anniversary of the meeting of the first Dáil on the 21st of January 1919. Now, in a way, that day set the tone for the years to come because as the Dáil was meeting, there was an unsanctioned ambush in uh, Tipperary. So, in a sense, that kicked the whole thing off, didn't it? Well, I suppose retrospectively, it's easy to see why that might seem the case. But, of course, these weren't the first deaths. There'd already been people killed during 1918. In fact, volunteers had been killed in Kerry and they tried to kill policemen in response but failed. So the, the killings in Tipperary were a shock. Um, they were unsanctioned, but I suppose, again, they're shrouded in a little bit of controversy because... In retrospect, Dan Breen claimed that it was necessary to kick things off and that he couldn't be waiting for the politicians to give him the go-ahead. But that was written very quickly after the Civil War and a lot of the politicians he was criticising had been on the other side in that Civil War, whereas people like Seamus Robinson, who's also there on the day, was a little bit more circumspect on whether the idea was to kill the policemen or not and argued that they'd been a clash, essentially, and, and the volunteers had had to shoot but hadn't necessarily planned to kill them. And certainly... At any stage in 1918 or 1919, you could have had events like that because the policy of the volunteers was to raid where possible for arms, to come out more openly and more confidently. And there were numerous clashes which didn't result in fatalities. But the coincidence, I think, of this occurring on the same day as the first doll makes it really irresistible in terms of a, as a, a starting point. And I think to some extent it establishes a pattern of IRA attacks because what they're after, they're not necessarily after, they don't necessarily want to kill RIC men, uh, but they are after explosives and presumably they're after the weapons of the RIC men. Yeah, I mean, the IRA right throughout this period, right up till 1921, is, is really very poorly armed. You know, even by the end of the war, I think their own figures are that they have about 3,000 rifles for, on paper, you know, maybe 70,000 volunteers, you know, or something in theory. So the, the aim was always to try and secure arms and ammunition in any way possible, whether to take them from farmers or landowners or get donations or smuggle them in. And the police, again, were, again, an irresistible target because the, the, the RIC were an armed force. They existed in every locality. If you had the numbers and you had surprise on your side, you could probably overwhelm a small number of policemen and take their weapons. And... Yes, initially, I suppose a lot of volunteers would have would have had qualms about killing the policemen as things radicalize and become more bitter as the year goes on. It starts to happen more regularly. And then, of course, by 1920, when you have an all-out offensive against the police, it's a very different situation. But initially, in most cases, it was possible to take police weapons and, you know, generally avoid fatalities. In 1919, as you say, volunteers were committed to an activist course. What about the politicians? Their, Sinn Féin was a coalition and what it was committed to was seeking independence and self-determination and that was being done under the label of the Republic. So what they were all committed to was abstention from the British Parliament, making the case for Irish independence at a post-war peace conference and I suppose making Ireland a global issue and possibly forcing Britain that way to recognise that a majority of Irish opinion had moved from the desire for home rule to that for independence. Within that, there were those who 
always thought this wouldn't happen without a fight. There were those who thought in terms of what would now be called, I suppose, mass civil disobedience and boycotts. And there were those who were a lot more wary about an open fight. And a few who still longed for the 1916 type idea of a conventional uprising as well. I mean, people like Terence McSweeney, for example, in Cork, still thought the Easter Rising held that kind of uh, 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 magnetic effect for him. Whereas others were thinking far more in terms of maybe undermining British rule through sabotage and so on. So there's a variety of opinions there's there's no consensus yet as to what exactly will happen except that they have declared independence. Now, Dahi, to what extent does this entity that we'll be discussing a lot over the next 10 weeks or so, uh, the IRA GHQ, General Headquarters, to what extent does it come into its own or does it ever come into its own? It doesn't really come into its own in the sense that the War of Independence is characterised, first of all, as a police war. It's a war between the IRA and the RIC. It is also characterised by a lack of coordination by mm. GHQ and, as Brian has mentioned, local activism. So Solahed Beg doesn't have the sanction of IRA GHQ and it certainly doesn't have the sanction of Sinn Féin, which does not seek a mandate for the military overthrow of British rule in Ireland. Uh, in fact, the Dáil doesn't take responsibility for the IRA campaign until as late as April 1921 and GHQ doesn't sanction militant action until as late as January 1920. So you could argue, Miles, that there is a case to be made that January 1920 is a more appropriate date for the beginning of the War of I mean, Independence. The people will find that very hard to believe, that the Dáil does not take responsibility for IRA actions until 1921, April of 1921. So literally within a few months of the truce. That's correct. Now, that's not to say that once... Um, a militant campaign is underway that that doesn't kind of create uh, a superficial sense of, of unity of purpose because that, that is certainly there. But I think it's important to realise that, as Brian mentioned, Sinn Féin is a coalition. There are divisions between the politicians and uh, the militants. The politicians repeatedly try to put a break on militant uh, activity and largely fail. When the British government suppress uh, the Dáil suppress uh, Sinn Féin, suppress Come the Man and the Gaelic League. That, in a sense, uh, is an ace card for the um, physical force men. They come into their own from that period, from late 1919 onwards. And through 1919 in particular, a, a lot of the military actions were about attacking... RIC stations, remote RIC stations, which would have been manned by perhaps, you know, no more than half a dozen RIC men and not all of those at any one time. Absolutely. Um, the RIC is about nine and a half thousand strong. It is dispersed in 1400 stations around the country. And by the end of the year, the smaller stations, which are police huts, typically staffed by three to four policemen, they become untenable. The police are withdrawn from those isolated stations and they are centralised in more fortified locations. And what this means is that large swathes of the country and particular counties are now virtually unpoliced. And if you're trying to create a Dáil counter-state and you're trying to create Dáil courts, these are ideal circumstances in which to do this. Because Heather, the Republicans essentially have to make themselves responsible for the running of rural Ireland. Um, one important institution uh, that he's already mentioned to demonstrate the fact that there was an element of control were the Dáil courts. These paralleled and then displaced the official system of law on the island. And you document that in your 2005 book, Subversive Law in Ireland, 1879 to 1920. How quickly did that happen and what was the process involved? Well, first of all, there's a gap. I mean, there had always, to some extent, been a gap in law in Ireland anyway. And throughout the 19th century, there had been alternative forms of legality where there was a kind of general sense that the law was the landlord's law, that it was associated with the conquest of the country. Um, I suppose what's different about the Doyle courts is that they deal with all aspects of crime. So essentially, they're, they're policing the country. Before the establishment of what we would now consider the Doyle courts, they were directly under the control of Doyle Aaron. There were ad hoc Sinn Féin courts. In, in parts of the country. But it was really May um, 1920 when you get the first uh, Dáil Court that is under direct control of Dáil Éireann. And it's uh, to do with the issue of land. From the very beginning, there had been a sense with Dáil Éireann, the first Dáil, we're going to do something about the legal aspects of the country, important to the establishment of a counter-state. And there was a real strong kind of legal front of the War of Independence. But it's really not until 
groups of farmers, substantial farmers, come to the doll from Connacht and they're saying, you know, our land has been seized, our cattle are being taken, um, there's cattle drives. We've gone to the RIC and the RIC have basically said they can't they can't help us. They don't have the manpower, they don't have the time to be protecting our land and our animals. And these animals are being seized and this land is being seized by essentially a criminal element, which uh, the re- makes... you know Republican police would be expected to deal with. Yeah, well, I suppose they wouldn't have considered themselves no, a criminal element. No, they wouldn't, and, and they were certainly... Um, um, they wouldn't would have found it very hard to distinguish between what they were doing at that point in time and what their predecessors had been doing at the time of the land war. Yeah, because the start and, date of your book is very interesting, yeah. 1879. Yeah, just because the essentially of the you have that coalition at that time, in the late 19th century in Ireland, that really interesting coalition between nationalists and the land agitation. That breaks down at the beginning of the 19th century starts, or 20th century starts to break down. Um, and for many mainstream nationalists, the land question has been solved by the Land Acts, the Land Purchase Act. But there's many people in Ireland who didn't benefit from the Land Purchase Acts. If you're a small holder, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. And then you have the First World War, you have restrictions on emigration, you also have rising um, beef prices. So there's real land hunger where you have graziers taking over large plots of land and that tension between agrarian capitalism and subsistence farming. You have a movement called the Back to the Land movement yes. and they are t- attempting to purchase land in order to settle smaller farmers on that land. Yes, they are. And often actually the land seizures happen after the landholder has refused to sell to these groups. So often there would be an attempt to actually buy the land first and then if the land owner refused to sell, then the land might be seized after that. Uh, The cattle driven away, levels of intimidation. Um, So, I mean, essentially what you have is landholders who would have been probably, most of them would have been unionist in terms of their politics. They would have been opposed to the Doyle ideologically. But they're going to the Doyle and they're asking for their help. And it's a great kind of, for the Doyle, it's a kind of, it's a real propaganda moment as well to be seen to, for for those who are opposed to them, to come to them to help police the country. So they can't really turn down that opportunity. Um, So the first Doyle court was a a land court. Um, After that, they dealt with all aspects of crime and they have different levels of court. They have a Supreme Court. They have a district court. Um, They have parish courts and then attached to the level of the district courts, they have circuit courts. You have lay people at the lower rungs um, and often women as well, which was an interesting element. Do they have something called arbitration courts? Because I remember reading an account of in one of the Bureau of Military History witness statements of the RIC actually arriving at a Republican court and asking, is this an an arbitration arbitration court? court? And being told, no, it's not. The implication being that if it was an arbitration court, they would have left it alone. Yes. I, I, and I actually I think the idea initially, I mean, Arthur, Arthur Griffith certainly had the idea that they would all be arbitration courts. And even in an independent Ireland, you might be able so to run it by arbitration courts. So this is, you have a row courts. with me over yes. land and, you and we go to the arbitration to go, court. And you both agree uh, to, to, to um, follow the outcome of that. It doesn't really work like that, though. Even from that very first land court in May 1920, what happens is, is that the judgment is in favour of the person who has the legal right to the land. And the claimants there range from a landless labour to somebody with eight acres. And they basically, they refuse to mm. follow the judgment. They continue to occupy the land. And that's when there's that key moment. What are they going to do? To go to Cahill Brewer, Kevin O'Sheill, who was at that stage was uh, the judge for that land court. He was court. a young barrister, yeah, basically. Yeah, he had been a young barrister. And he uh, goes to Carl Brewer, who says, no, 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 it's the military campaign. We're not interested in that. The law can wait till afterwards. But he goes to Arthur Griffith then, and an IRA unit is brought down. They take those men and they put them on an island. And that was then a kind of feature of the Dole Courts. They marooned them on marooned an them island. Marooned them on an island. Off so, the coast or in the middle of a lake? or um, It was in Loch Carb, right. I think, that, that particular island. So you go from a situation where, you know, supposedly these are going to be arbitration courts but they're not they need to be enforced mostly because actually the Doyle courts by and large protected the private property rights so people are either put on islands or else you might be sent to a different county or else they might be sent to England and in fact in the House of Commons at this time there's people saying you know Ireland is turning England into some sort of um, penal colony by sending its convicts over to us 
Uh, let's hear the words of Ker Davitt. Ker Davitt was the son of the Land League founder, Michael Davitt. He was a young barrister. He would go on to become a justice of the High Court in the 1950s. But as a barrister, he was working on the Connacht circuit during the War of Independence and finding that briefs were few and far between, thanks to the establishment of the Republican Arbitration Courts. I never did appear in any capacity in a Republican court until I did so as a judge. They, however, began seriously to affect me. On account of the disturbed state of the country, the Assize and County Courts sat in courthouses sandbagged for defence and guarded by the British military. Litigants began to desert them for the Republican Courts, and soon I was hearing from solicitors the unwelcome news that certain cases in which they had sent me briefs had been transferred to the Republican Courts and there disposed of without my assistance. It became apparent after a short while that the bulk of my practice was in process of being so transferred. Heather, Davitt then goes on to become a judge of the Republican courts himself. Yeah, he's a really interesting figure because he was very young. He was only in his mid-twenties. He had been called to the bar in 1916 and then he finds himself four years later a judge of the circuit court. The circuit court, the idea of that was that the district courts, they didn't have enough people with legal training. So the circuit court was attached to the district court. Every district court was supposed to have a circuit court sitting three times a year. It didn't really work out like that. He ends up essentially not only in Connacht, but he ends up around uh, a lot of the country, basically um, disguising himself, pretending to be somebody other than he is. He's only in his mid-20s at the time, but there was huge respect for him. In terms um, of his judgments, what about what about women? Because this is around the time that uh, a woman, a wonderful woman called Georgina Frost, uh, has taken a case uh, all the way to the House of Lords and has had a judgment in her favour and is allowed to become a petty sessions clerk in County Clare. Now, obviously, she's on the other side, yes. uh, if you like, of the argument. But was there any room for women in the Doll Courts? That was probably one of the most interesting aspects of the Doll Courts. In many ways, they actually quite closely merged the official court system and by and large the the law they followed was the law of the official court system. They were allowed to make reference to the Breton laws as well but what was interesting about them was the involvement of women. It took post-revolutionary Ireland over 40 years to even come close to the number of women who were involved Um, and that's because at the lower rungs of the court you didn't need legal training. So people like Maud Gawne McBride, uh, Hannah Shea Skeffington, Kathleen Clark, all of those, they were judges um, at the parish court level or even the district court level. In terms of the use of the Breton laws, uh, there were some interesting judgments made in terms of women. Um, So for example there was a case in Cork where a single mother took a case against the father of her child to get um, money for the upkeep of her child. And the judge who was James Creed Murdered ruled in favour of the single mother, saying that this was in keeping with the Breton laws. So you could invoke the Breton laws? You could in the invoke Republic the Breton laws. And he, if you felt it was relevant to contemporary um, situations, and he felt that in this regard, that, that this was in keeping with the Breton laws. And he claimed in a piece he wrote in 1940 that this was then followed throughout um, the rest of the history of the Doyle Courts. But this all comes crashing to a halt in the 1920s. Yes, it does. I mean, essentially, the, the Doyle courts collapse really in that tensions, the pro-treaty, anti-treaty tensions. After all, I mean, the other name for them was the Republican courts. You know, once it's clear that a republic isn't in the offing, they sort of fall foul of that. They're seen to be in this kind of strange place. And even the name the Doyle courts connects them really with the first Doyle. So essentially what happens is they're subsumed under the legal system that we have now, which is really a continuation of the, the system that existed before. We'll come back and we'll talk about Meredith uh, a little bit later later in the way we've talked already about uh, about Ker Davis. But um, Dahi, in the Irish Revolution series, you're going to be looking at the experience of each county, most of the counties at least, probably not all 32 of them we were talking uh, earlier, during this revolutionary period. Does each county have a unique experience or are there, you know, can you categorise them as active, inactive? One of the most surprising things as an editor of a series of this scale, Miles, is that the experience in each county has been quite unique. So there are, of course, parallels, there are intersections in terms of radicalism, um, militant activity and so on. But every county is quite unique. So to give you an example, in Roscommon during the, the Irish Revolution, the main concern is land. 
it's not really about the pursuit of a republic, or at, at least that pursuit is a secondary one, but land is the predominant uh, issue. How did that manifest itself? Did it manifest itself with uh, recourse to what we've been talking to Heather about, or did it manifest itself with uh, guns and bombs? Um, absolutely. So there is a lot of land seizures, land grabbing, agrarian agitation of great concern, of course, uh, to Sinn Féin and the IRA, because they do not want their political project to be uh, derailed by an agreement agrarian issue. So the Dáil courts become very important in hitting off any potential for agrarianism to kind of deflect attention from the pursuit of the of the Republic. So then in other areas, I mean, why is it that, for example, a county like Longford is so active? You know, Longford is in the North Midlands, but other counties in the North Midlands uh, are not particularly active. Um, a lot of it comes down to what is happening at a local level. Because the War of Independence is so localised, there are huge variations, not just between counties, but within counties. And IRA companies, IRA battalions and even IRA brigades are largely held together by local ties or ties of personality. So where you have prominent local activists. So in Longford it's Sean McKeown basically. In Longford it's Sean McKeown. The same is true in, in most of Munster and in Dublin. You tend to have more uh, militant activism there. But one of the things I suppose that has uh, emerged from the series is that in many counties ordinary individuals can also protest by not recognising the British courts, by recognising the Dáil courts. So there's quite a lot of uh, what we might call passive resistance uh, to British rule. Even if we go back to the start and you consider Solohed Beg and the comments of the Nina Guardian uh, in the immediate aftermath, so they abhor the killings, but they also add that Ireland is under the heel of an iron despotism. So uh, there is a growing hostility to the RIC and to British rule and many people at a local level can resist that by ignoring the forces of the Crown. In addition to passive resistance, there's also a lot of active collaboration, mostly with the Republican forces, some obviously with the Crown forces as well. That's a different story, and it's a a story we will cover later in the series. But a lot of people are helping uh, the IRA, are helping uh, active service units. I'm thinking, you know, for example, of uh, Michael Brennan's witness statement in, in County Clare. He talks about the extent to which they were assisted, you know, even to the point of priests coming out and saying mass oh, yes. for flying columns, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. That's going on everywhere, isn't it? Well, I mean, th- there's also quite a lot of uh, intimidation. So, for example, when the Dáil backs a boycott of the RIC uh, in 1919, it's not just RIC men who are boycotted. It's their families. It's uh, those who trade with them. In some parts of the country, even as early as 1919, the RIC are forced to commandeer food supplies or starve because traders are unwilling to trade with them. One unfortunate woman in Roscommon had pig rings attached to her buttocks with pincers for allegedly supplying the RIC with milk. So when you have that sort of level of organisation and enforcement of this uh, 19th century tactic of the boycott, the ordinary population are not willing to run the risk of opposing the IRA. And many people simply, if they're not assisting the IRA, don't actively hinder them and keep their heads down. Brian, one of the problems with the mythology and historiography of the War of Independence is that Labour never gets a look in anywhere. So let's rectify that Mm -hmm. to some extent anyway. Looking north, in Belfast in January of 1919, there was a huge engineering strike. What was that about? Well, that was, you know, really for the 44-hour week, but it was part of both a European and a UK-wide movement of Labour confidence after the First World War, which Ireland was certainly part of. And the fact that the first all, you know, issued a democratic programme was really a a reference to the fact that they wanted the support of the Irish Labour movement and they also wanted the support of Labour internationally because this was a way of Irish Labour going to the international socialist movement and saying our our new parliament has a has a social program that you should be prepared to endorse. The Belfast strike was part of a UK movement for a shorter working week. But it was interesting in that it coincided with Red Clyde site when the British army were sent into the streets of Glasgow. And British troops were moved into Belfast. But the Belfast strike leadership were fairly cautious. They weren't affiliated to Dáil Éireann, certainly. A considerable number of the strike leadership were unionist politically, and the majority of the strikers would have been Protestant, although the leadership was mixed and included Catholics and, and socialists as and well. was there antagonism between them at all? Not at this point. I mean, the strike leadership were, were keen not to antagonise 
their own supporters, but not to antagonise the authorities either. The authorities were also wary of sending troops onto the streets in Belfast because the situation in Ireland was generally becoming more unstable and they didn't want to deplete their own resources. Ultimately, the strike was unsuccessful, although it paralysed Belfast and involved up to 50,000 people in the end. Um, In the longer run, many of the strike leadership, both Protestant and Catholic, lost their jobs in 1920 when the uh, Belfast shipyards and so on were effectively um, cleansed of Catholics and disloyal elements, as they were referred to. But the strike was was emblematic of a growing confidence of Labour across Ireland. And in other parts of the country, the Labour movement is much more closely aligned, of course, with the Dáil and, and with republicanism. Where does the Limerick Soviet fit into this is patchwork? Wonderful book by Liam Cattle uh, written about it, but it, it's established in April of 1919. And its establishment is related to the War of Independence. But again, it's a, it's a trade union driven a strike, basically, isn't it? it? Yeah, it reflects both the growing confidence of the Republican movement and also the fact that many of the fatal clashes that year occur in the context of attempts to rescue prisoners other than targeted killings, for example. So in Limerick, you have a, a Republican called Bobby Burns who's been arrested, taken part in a prison protest. He's sick, he's in hospital, he's being guarded by the police. Burns is also a, a postal worker and a trade unionist. The IRA attempt to rescue him. In the course of the rescue, Burns is killed and a policeman is also shot dead. In response, the authorities declare Limerick a special military area, which is effectively putting it under local martial law. And they also require the population to get special permits to enter into the Limerick city area. And this discomforts thousands of people who have to go to work in and out of Limerick every day. So the trade unions, who some of whom are sympathetic to the Republican movement already, but who also are, are growing in confidence, the transport union in Limerick and nationally is growing hugely in, in membership that year. They declare a strike essentially in protest at the special military restrictions. This escalates to the point that Limerick is effectively under trade union control. Limerick City, at least, ends up issuing its own currency. There are a large number of journalists in the Limerick area because there was going to be an attempted transatlantic flight. They view this at first hand. The strikers use the term Soviet, which is in vogue, but also then it's dubbed this in the international press and this makes perfect sense in the context of 1919. People know immediately what you mean. The British authorities bring lots of troops into Limerick, but again, they're a bit wary of a general clash between the regular British army. There's some evidence, again, of regular British soldiers not being very enthusiastic about clashing with ordinary workers. This is pre-Ogsies and pre Yes, it is, yes. So it's well. the regular British army mm. and, and the, the RIC. And there's some elements of, of fraternisation, in fact, during the strike as well. And they're wary of deploying deploying troops, you know, on the scale they would need to be deployed to break a general strike in Limerick. So you've got two weeks, essentially, of a strike in Limerick, which the strike leadership appeal for national support. The national trade union leadership are a little bit wary of trying to call a general strike across the country in support of this. But again, it reflects growing confidence, the fact that thousands of people are prepared to go on strike, but also then that they're identifying British rule with despotism, as Dahi has said. The rhetoric of the strike very much regards it as illegitimate for the British to try and impose this type of restrictions on life in Limerick. And of course, it also radicalises events further because the Republican movement in Limerick also gains confidence from the fact that so many people are alienated from the authorities. So, Dahi, does this mean that Labour is not sidelined between 1919 and the middle of 1921 as it was, say, in the 1918 general election? I don't think sidelined is the way to look at it. I think it's a vital ally for the Dáil administration. So the ITGWU is a massive organisation. It is 100,000 members in 1919. It is even more in 1920. And key groups like railwaymen who are backed by the ITGWU and the IRA are very important. So at different times, for example, they refuse to transport armed soldiers and police or munitions. And if you're a British military commander in somewhere like the Curra, you're dependent on trains to move troops from the Curra to Dublin or to Cork or wherever. So this becomes a huge weapon, if you like, uh, for the Dáil administration. So I would really see the Labour movement as a vital ally for the Dáil. And it is really, I suppose, after the treaty is signed that Labour is so disappointed because it expects some sort of payback for its support and activism during the War of Independence. Okay, we're going to take a quick break now. When we return, we'll be talking more about the Republican courts and the First Thal's efforts at international outreach and how the Irish Republic was financed. Follow us on Twitter at RTE History Show.
Welcome back to The History Show on RTE Radio 1 and the first episode in our series on the Irish War of Independence. I'm joined in studio by Heather Laird, Brian Hanley and Dahi O'Coran. Um, Dahi, a crucial feature of the conflict was the propaganda war. Um, starting with the general election in 1918, one of the chief aims was to take the case for Irish independence abroad because you had the Versailles, uh, well, it was the Versailles Treaty, but the Paris peace negotiations going on around this time. Absolutely. Seeking international recognition for an Irish Republic was the key objective of Sinn Féin. So at the inaugural meeting of the Thal, there was an appeal, of course, to the free nations of the world. A team headed by Sean T. O'Calla was dispatched to Paris, but failed to gain admission to the peace conference. Now, this setback was not insurmountable. And instead, the Dáil, the Department of Publicity and the Department of Foreign Affairs focused their efforts on bringing the message of an Irish Republic to an international audience. And one of the chief means they did that was by utilising the newspapers, by producing the Irish Bulletin, which was aimed at informing the international media rather than a, a national audience. And then and was quite accurate for what was essentially a propaganda sheet because I think foreign journalists had a considerable respect for whatever was published in the Irish Bulletin. Well, they had. They? I mean, it was regarded as quite accurate. It was translated into several European languages. And even from the very beginning, so from the uh, meeting of the first Thal, Sinn Féin very carefully cultivated foreign journalists. About 50 British and foreign journalists were present for the first Thal. They were given a reception after the Thal and that careful cultivation of pressmen uh, continued. Art O'Brien, who was the Thal representative in London, played a really important role in this in terms of ensuring that foreign journalists, particularly from 1920 onwards, could visit Ireland uh, in person. And on Thoglock, which is the Volunteers newspaper edited by Pierce Beastie, what role, if any, did that play in any of this? Or is that just specifically aimed at the Irish Volunteers? Uh, I suppose it's specifically aimed at the Volunteers and the IRA. So it's a very important means of informing them about basic tactics, about military education, because most of the IRA volunteers have very little military. But not background. meant for wide circulation. Uh, it's not meant for wide circulation, but the very fact that it could be produced at all was in itself a propaganda coup. Heather, the court system was important in the propaganda war as well, wasn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And foreign journalists were often invited along to Dáil Court hearings. The Dáil Courts are really important in terms of that idea of that we are capable, the people who are fighting for Ireland at the moment are also capable of running the country. So you had foreign journalists, as said, brought along, but you also had Sinn Féin publicists supplying information to newspapers about what was happening in Doyle Courts and what was happening in terms of the kind of policing of the country by volunteers. So the Freeman's Journal, for example, carried a piece in June 1920, which basically was a summary of all of the kind of policing actions of the volunteers over a couple of months period and covering pretty much every county in Ireland. And it was very detailed and clearly based in fact, but it is also packaged to send a particular message that uh, we can actually govern the country, we can control the country. And so having key people involved in the Doyle courts was really important in terms of that legitimacy for the court, which was also going to be legitimacy for the Doyle. As we said, David was really important because of his name, but also having people who had been high up in the official legal system working for the Doyle courts, that was also really important. So people like James Cree Meredith, who was King's counsel under the official legal system, the transfer of his allegiance to the Doyle Court, you know, is key as well to giving legitimacy to the Doyle Court. Now, in early 1919, the first Thal sent a mission to Paris to make the case for Irish independence to the uh, post-war peace conference, as we've already heard from Dahi. While that mission failed to obtain international recognition, the Dáil did keep up an overseas network of emissaries on several continents, whose purpose was to keep the claim for independence front and centre in terms of international public opinion. Earlier, Lorcan Clancy went to the National Archives of Ireland and met historian John Gibney to find out more. By mid-1919, the hope of securing international support for the Dáil's assertion of independence had faded, as the victorious powers after World War I were not sympathetic to the Irish cause. But the Dáil made a decision to keep 
a delegation in Paris because the peace conference would continue beyond the Treaty of Versailles and given the fact that the world's attention was focused upon Paris, they assumed it would be a perfect opportunity to lobby, to keep international attention focused upon their cause, to make the political case for Irish independence. So that task continued in Paris well beyond June 1919, but it also began to spread worldwide. The Dáil began to establish a network of representatives around the world to continue to make the case for Irish independence. Attempting to do something akin to what the Irish delegation were doing in Paris. Disseminate propaganda, highlight the iniquities of British rule and British repression, form alliances with like-minded individuals and groups who could possibly support that objective. And that became a strand of the independence struggle that ran throughout the War of Independence and, I suppose, filtered into the foundation of the Free State and beyond. These emissaries were posted as far afield as Argentina. Eamon Bolfin, an Argentine-born veteran of the Easter Rising, was accredited by de Valera as the Irish Republic's representative there. Eamon or Edmund Bolfin was born in Buenos Aires in 1892, the son of a journalist from Offaly who had emigrated to Argentina, William Bolfin, and who edited the Southern Cross newspaper. He returned to Ireland at some point, attended St. Enda's School, joined groups such as the IRB, Nafina Air and the Irish Volunteers. I was involved in the Easter Rising where he fought in the GPO and was also involved, was present at the last stand, if you will, in Moore Street. He was arrested in the German plot arrests of 1918 and deported to Argentina by the British authorities. Sinn Féin and the Dáil took the view that under the circumstances he might come in handy as their Argentinian representative. Bolfin was one of a number of de facto Irish diplomats in Latin America during these years. He was based in Buenos Aires and communications with Dublin were kind of difficult enough in that regard. He directly liaised with Michael Collins as well as his nominal superiors and was involved in a couple of things, seeking publicity for the Irish cause, raising money, and he also was involved in attempts to procure weapons for the IRA. Bolfin was also joined by Westmeath TD Lawrence Ginnell to form the de facto consular service. Their correspondence back to Dublin is held in the National Archives. These are the files that would have been sent back to Dublin to the, what was then the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, we have Mission Diplomatica de la Republica de Irlanda, a Spanish letterhead on an Irish document addressed to Arthur Griffith. Mission Diplomatica de la Republica de Irlanda, November 18th, 1921. Acara, you may be aware from my reports to the Minister of Finance that I was hoping to be able to get a sufficiently reliable staff here. So far, I have met with only indifferent success. Achara, a report on general activities here has long been due to you and has been delayed owing to pressure of work. In this country of manana, however, one cannot do things too hastily. It mentions that, you know, they've got instructions from Dublin to carry out their activities. It mentions how they've travelled around various parts of Argentina, speaking about Ireland. Mr Griffith, at the banquet in the evening there were present the vice-governor of the province, the secretary, representing the chief of police, the mayor of the city and other important people. And it does give a sense that they were trying to influence politicians, they were trying to influence the civic elite. You get a sense from here of the reach of this diplomatic service. They distributed propaganda, they sought to raise funds, they sought to highlight the Irish cause. Our reception in Mercedes was very good also, but it is not so much to be wondered at, for Mercedes is practically an Irish town. This was one of the further flung outposts of Sinn Féin's diplomatic service, but there were other representatives closer to home, in Scandinavian countries, in Germany, in Bolshevik Russia and also in Spain. There were a number of women involved in the Sinn Féin diplomatic service and one of those was a lady called Moira O'Brien, who was a daughter of James Xavier O'Brien, um, originally from Dungarvan, who had been a member of the Fenians and ultimately became MP for Cork until his death in 1905. She was um, residing in Barcelona prior to the Easter Rising of 1916 and in subsequent years and various trips back to Ireland seems to have gotten involved in the independence movement to various degrees and in 1920 offered her services to uh, the First Dáil as a possible agent in Spain and in early 1921 she officially took up such a position We can see in her reports back to Ireland the attempt to lobby influential people and newspapers to influence public opinion. Report from May and June 1921. I established myself at this address on May 3rd 
and issued the Madrid Bulletin No. 1 on May 25th. I think Barcelona is all right. In Madrid, it is not so easy to manage the press. They are, in many cases, afraid of England. In the last fortnight, I have been doing the rounds of the newspaper offices. So she was lobbying the press. She was attempting to lobby politicians. She did so both from Madrid and from Barcelona. And it's quite typical of the kind of things that Sinn Féin Mysteries were involved in. I soon got to know some half a dozen Irish girls here. And I think it only right to say how devoted they have shown themselves to the cause, giving me every assistance in their power. It's fair to say that in the aftermath of the First World War, the world was being rearranged. New states were emerging. It's not enough to say that you're sovereign necessarily in terms of the reality of international relations. It has to be recognised by elsewhere. So there was a practical side, of course, to seeking recognition from other countries. But there was also the... You can't underestimate the symbolic value of it. And it's implicit within the rhetoric of Sinn Féin throughout these years that it's almost as if they weren't seeking Irish independence. You could say that, as far as they were concerned, they had independence and just needed to get the rest of the world and the British to recognise that fact. Lorcan Clancy was reporting there from the National Archives in Dublin. He was speaking to historian John Gibney about some of the figures involved in the Irish Republic's network of overseas missions. My guests in studio, Brian Hanley, Heather Laird and Dahi O'Coron. Brian, we heard there about uh, overseas missions in Argentina and in Spain, but I suppose de Valera's trip to the United States in the summer of 1919 was was crucial in terms of fundraising and I presume in terms of propaganda as well, was it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the United States was where the biggest section of the diaspora lived. It already had a well-established Irish Republican network in the Clan na Gael and the Friends of Irish Freedom, which had been increasing in strength since the Easter Rising. It was also not only potentially a place where money could be raised, and that was very important, but it was also key to international recognition because, after all, President Woodrow Wilson had been the person who talked about self-determination being the key factor in the post-war world. So part of the reason for de Valera's visit to the United States is to try and get formal American recognition for the Republic, or at least get the recognition of both the Democratic and Republican parties for the principle of Irish self-determination. And of course, America was also a political melting pot and an ethnic melting pot where the Irish could also make connections with the Indian diaspora, with representatives of Zionism, with representatives of Bolsheviks. I mean, Irish Bolshevik connections are actually made in New York by Patrick McCartan and, and Liam Mellows and others. So this was where you would meet revolutionaries from across the world as well as trying to influence American opinion and also deal with Irish America which was a vital factor. But of course the first item on the agenda is always the split and uh, de Valera did fall, you mentioned the Friends of Irish Freedom, did fall foul of John Devoy and Justice Cahillan who would have been the leaders of the Friends of Irish Freedom whereas he retained the uh, the alliance of someone like Sean McGarrity for example. What what was all that about? What happened there? Was it, was it jealousy of this man coming to the USA declaring himself President of the Irish Republic? Well, I think firstly, it, it can't be underestimated how, how big an impact de Valera's visit has. I mean, he packs out Madison Square Gardens, Fenway Park and the polo grounds in New York and so on. America is talking about this man and his visit and he visits all the great American cities, north and south, and creates huge publicity for the idea of an Irish Republic, also begins to raise serious amounts of money as well. In America, then, you have people like John Devoy, a veteran Fenian, dedicated Republican, who's you know, a little bit upset by the arrival of de Valera as president of the Republic. De Valera is not a member of the IRB, for example. All these things start to matter, not to the general public at all, and not even to Irish America in general, but to those active in Republican politics. So there's always a little bit of tension about whether this is about building the profile of the Republic internationally or de Valera's profile or... Devoy and Colehan, in particular, obsessed with America's role, America not joining the League of Nations, becoming, you know, a rival of Britain on the world stage and so on. De Valera, keen not to antagonise, you know, key sections of American opinion. Don't insult the American president, he says, you know, at rallies and so on. And then ultimately De Valera, in 1920, he's outlining why an independent Ireland would not be a threat to Britain. And the British argument is, how do we know we're not going to get stabbed in the back if the Irish get independence levels here? That's not the case at all. You know, you have a case where, you know, Cuba has gained a level of independence and it isn't a threat to the United States. And this is taken up by some 
you know, in the United States was saying, well, De Valera is comparing Ireland to Cuba, but Cuba is quite clearly subservient to the United States. So De Voy accuses De Valera of abandoning republicanism, leads a split. Not very successfully in, in real terms, De Valera retains by far majority support within Irish America. But the bitterness within that split adds, you know, a further frizz onto the activities within the US itself. But really it's it's a multi-layered campaign in the US and it does succeed in raising over $5 million for the doll, which is, which is a huge achievement and couldn't really have been done anywhere else. Sean Noonan, veteran of the Easter Rising, was asked by De Valera to accompany him on his tour of America. In an interview with RTE in the 1960s, he talked about the typical reception De Valera got at many of the rallies he attended. We went to Cleveland. On the outskirts of the city, he was met by all the civic dignitaries, motorcycle escort, a couple of planes overhead. And when we got into the main street in Cleveland, Euclid Avenue, the whole place was roped off to keep the crowds back. It was the same thing everywhere. San Francisco, Butte, Montana, anywhere he went. The voice of Sean Noonan there from the RTE Radio Archives. Thahi, while De Valera was touring the US, you've already mentioned people like Art O'Brien spreading the word in London. How important is O'Brien, and particularly in the enemy's capital, basically? He's hugely important. Uh, in fact, one of my uh, most recent PhD students has completed a new study of O'Brien and we will know a lot more about him when she finishes uh, her book on him. He's important for channeling funds. He's important for purchasing arms, which are smuggled to Ireland. He's very important in terms of liaising with the foreign press. And that really hits a high point uh, during uh, the hunger strike and death of, of Terence McSweeney. He sort of sees himself as sort of the foremost ambassador of the Dáil. So he regards himself as far more important and prominent than other diplomatic agents uh, of the Dáil in, in other places, including the likes of Paris or Rome, where Sean T. O'Kelly went after he left Paris. Brian, you mentioned De Valera coming back or raising $5 million in the USA, but money was also being raised locally. Money was being raised in Ireland. What exactly was the Dáil loan and how did it operate? Well, by the summer of 1919, I mean, the Dáil has been reorganised further because in January there were very few TDs present in Ireland. A lot of them were in jail or on the run. By April, De Valera has been broken out of Lincoln Prison. Um, some of the prisoners who'd been held since 1918 are released. So you've got a much more organised counter-state coming into being and there's a whole reshuffle of the cabinet and so on. Michael Collins becomes Minister for Finance. It's sometimes forgotten in all the talk about Collins that he actually had a very public role in the Dáil and he was an accountant and o Collins is really tasked by the Dáil with coming up with the means of supporting this counter-state because the mission to Paris cost money, paying the salaries of, of the people who the Dáil had to employ, producing propaganda and so on cost money. So the way in which to do this was the idea of a loan. People would give a loan to the Irish Republic and this was a way of both showing support and also practically raising money. And in the autumn of, of 1919, the Dáil produced a short motion picture which was then shown in cinemas throughout the country, sometimes with the help of the volunteers when <laughs> cinema owners were reluctant to show it because, of course, uh, it was it would have been uh, subject to censorship uh, otherwise. It's basically was. take down Douglas yeah. Fairbanks and put up the Republican okay. own movie. <laughs> and put up Michael Collins because he appears in this taking subscriptions at St. Enda's and Margaret Pierce, the mother of Porrick Pierce, is one of the people who appears giving a subscription. And it's very interesting because there, you know, I think around £370,000 are raised in Ireland. And again, you can go from area to area, county to county to see who contributes most and who contributes less and so on. But that money, while substantial, and of course it is a substantial commitment by people, is not going to be enough. And actually, that's one of the reasons why they have to go international and go globally in terms of trying to raise far greater funds. Because again, an enormous amount of the constituency wouldn't have had a great deal of, of money to give. So this is both a commitment to the Republic, but also a very practical means. And Collins is, is very key to that fundraising, while he's also, during 1919, engaged in a lot more... Um, Nefarious. Yes. Yeah. And, or behind uh, the scenes, at least. Yeah, very much so. We'll be dealing with that in a couple of subsequent programmes. Raising huge amounts of money was no easy task, obviously, as uh, you will have got from Brian, and would call for great coordination and support from both the Republicans and the public. In this clip from the RTE Radio Archives, Joseph O'Doherty, TD for North Donegal and commanding officer of the IRA in Derry City, describes how the money was raised. The local branches of Sinn Féin, uh, throughout the constituency, they made the collections. Collections were 
uh, public meetings and also promises taken and then collected afterwards by the common and forwarded them to the to headquarters. And uh, that was the voice of Joseph O'Doherty, TD for North Donegal and commanding officer of the IRA in the city of Derry. Thought he obviously the money that was coming from the Republican loan could not be banked in Sinn Féin account number one or Sinn Féin account number two. What happened the money in order to keep it secure? Well, proxies were used to bank the money, but the most effective way to make the accounts secure was to assassinate the man that Dublin Castle appointed, a forensic accountant, I suppose, a guy by the name of Alan Bell. He was pulled off a tram on the 26th of March 1920 and assassinated. And all the detective work he had done trying to locate the funds Mm. died with him. Yeah, something we will be dealing with in uh, great detail a little bit later on in one of the future programmes. And uh, Heather, the kind of things the money was used for, for example, it was used to fund the new institutions of the Irish Republic. I'm sure some of it went into the the county councils, which were also very, very successful. But uh, Ker Davitt is very interesting in his witness statement. £750 per annum he was paid uh, for his role as a judge of the Mm. Dáil Courts. Money, I think, which was... um, very welcome at the time because his business was begin- was beginning to evaporate. Yeah, I suppose with, with the Doyle courts, a lot of the people involved in the lower rungs were lay people. So they weren't being paid as such. In terms of those who they would have had to pay, were the actual legally trained judges who had crossed over from the official system. Um, and one of the ways that they tried to make the Doyle courts kind of self-financing was that if you were bringing a case, uh, you had to pay a fee for doing that. I'm sure it didn't cover the entire cost of the Doyle courts, but there was an attempt to self-fund them and, and various different degrees of fees depending for example on where the, the case was going to be held how long it would take the judge to get there etc. There's a scene I'm not sure if any of you have seen The Wind That Shakes yes. the Barley mm-hmm. you're all nodding so you I think you know what I'm going to say there's a scene in The Wind That Shakes the Barley in which there is a Republican court and it's uh, Widow mm. Impecunious Widow versus Very Pecunious Gombean Man the Gombean man wins. wins. And there's an explanation afterwards for the reason for that, and it is because the Gombean man has basically been helping to fund the IRA. IRA. Is there an element of, of truth, do you think, in that? I, I think what the film is actually trying to get at is that conflict between the sort of legal front of the war and the military front. Because there were those who felt that the military war was the more important one and the legal battle was not, you know, the attempt to kind of take over control to assert a counter state, that that was not as important. So I think in The Wind That Shakes the Barley, what we have is a female judge. You know, there's also an attempt to point at the gender aspects of the Doyle Court. So this female judge, she convicts somebody, but actually the IRA man gets him off because Mm. refuses to convict this person because this person has supplied guns. So that conflict between the military aspects and the counter-state aspect. Yeah, the revolution itself, you know, had for many people produced all kinds of hopes and aspirations and this included large numbers of smallholders on the land. Rural labourers, I mean, the largest group joining the Irish Transport Union in 1919-1920 are are farm labourers, you know, because there's thousands of them in the country. And many of those people did expect that the revolution would mean a real change in their lives as well. So the police reports, for example, capture the fact that Sinn Féin supporters are seizing land, Sinn Féin supporters are involved in cattle drives, Sinn Féin supporters are involved in strikes. And meanwhile, the Dáil is very concerned to put forward a view to the world that they've got control of this situation, that it's very orderly. And they're very pleased when unionist landlords, for example, Mm. praise the Dáil courts and say Mm. these people turned out to be very rational and fair. But that's a double-edged sword because you're also disillusioning some of your own supporters. So at a low Local level, the IRA might be asked to prevent a land seizure, but many of those IRA volunteers might be labourers themselves or small farmers. And this produces tensions within the IRA as well. So it's it's always, you know, there's always a tension and all, things are always a knife edge. And this is reflected at local level in disputes within republicanism. But what exactly are we fighting for? Actually, the, the more that the British government ups repression, the more the Republicans can present a united front because it's clear there is a common enemy. But during 1919, for example, when things aren't quite as severe as they become, you do see a lot of these tensions expressed and uh, the question being raised as, why aren't Sinn Féin in favour of all this land distribution? I thought Mm. that's what we were for. Uh, A a, a footnote, I don't know whether you would agree with me, but I think The Wind That Shakes the Barley is a a fantastic film and if anybody is looking for to get a feel of what the War of Independence might have been like, and then of course subsequently the, the Civil War because that comes into it as well, would you agree, well, worth watching? Do you think it's historically fairly accurate? 
I think it's it's far more accurate than Michael Collins, which has been ah, a, well, which has been a very be. more influential film. <laughs> that wouldn't be. I, that I wouldn't do, be difficult. I do think that the social and economic aspect is is overplayed to the extent that that's not the key divider in the civil war, but it does give you far more of an idea of both the local tensions and also problematic things like the killing of informers. You know, it mm. it gives you a far grittier, I think, impression of the. The conflict. You would agree? I, I'd, I'd agree with Brian and I think it's interesting because The Wind That Shakes to Barley, that's the film that it's often has been accused of being kind of propagandist. I don't think it's any more propagandist than Michael Collins. It's just Michael Collins is more in line with the orthodoxy and with the received kind of wisdom. So therefore, um, it didn't have those same kind of charges put against it. Right, I think you were unanimous on that one. Watch The Wind That Shakes the Barley. Don't bother with uh, Michael Collins if you're looking for some sort of a feel of the the War of Independence. That probably being a bit unfair to Michael Collins. But anyway, um, the RIC, we've talked about, Brian is talking earlier about the, the boycotting of the RIC. Did that result in mass resignations from the RIC, which ultimately leads to the arrival, the recruitment of the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries, Dahi? Absolutely. Um, so from April 1919 onwards, the Dáil backs a general boycott of, of the RIC. There is also an increasing scale of violence against the RIC. About 18 members of the RIC were killed in 1919. 22 were killed in the first four months of 1920 alone and almost 200 by the end of 1920. So for RIC constables and sergeants, the sensible course of action to preserve life and limb was to retire, to resign or keep as low a profile as possible. So more people leave the RIC between 1919 and 1921, more than double than in the previous decade. Those gaps have to be filled somehow. And that really is the key explanation for the arrival of the Black and Tans, who are temporary constables of the RIC, the first arrive from February onwards, and then the auxiliaries who arrive from July 1920. Brian, De Valera is out of the country. You've already talked about that. Is that what allows Michael Collins to come to such prominence in the Republican movement and to assume this dual role of Director of Intelligence and Minister for Finance? No, I mean, I think Collins would have come to prominence anyway, and he already had, in fact, because he was key from 1918 in in much of the the reorganisation. But I think what allows him to come to prominence is the importance of Dublin and the importance of intelligence in Dublin and the fact that IRA headquarters are based in Dublin and in Dublin they really do have a much tighter control than they do elsewhere. And Collins is is really the key figure there along with Richard Mulcahy and Dick McKee. And in Dublin, Collins senses very early on the key need to combat Dublin Castle and the administration's intelligence system. And the organisation of the squad, that was not a, a jolly, if you like, of Collins himself. That was approved of by the Dáil Cabinet, wasn't it? Well, I mean, there's a grey area there. I mean, certainly they were handpicked by Collins. And again, even within the IRA, there were very mixed feelings about the organisation of the squad and what control they had. These were men who were full time. They were almost all 1916 veterans. They were paid and so on. The majority of the Dublin Brigade was not active 24 hours a day. The squad were, and I think this, in the longer run, when we examine the squad, I think there are a lot of aspects of it that are that are going to make sense when we when we arrive at the Civil War in, in the way they're organised. But again, these, these men were given a choice as to whether they'd be, you know, able to assassinate people because in most policemen killed in 1919 in general were killed in clashes. The decision to start shooting detectives in Dublin is a marked change in policy. It's thought about it long beforehand. Some members of the Dublin Brigade, again, some, including some who'd fought in 1916, are not very keen at all and not in favour. There's a rivalry within the Cabinet in, in, in terms of people like Cahill Brewer, who's technically Minister for Defence and, and a senior figure over Collins and Mulcahy and so on. But Collins really organises the squad himself. They're more or less handpicked. They're intensely loyal to him. And they have a, a complex relationship with the rest of the IRA structure in Dublin. And as the war goes on, they expand somewhat and, and other members of the IRA become more involved in these intelligence operations too. But in the beginning, they're very closely associated with Collins and very closely associated with the idea of intelligence and combating Dublin Castle specifically. We will be dealing with the squad and with the intelligence war in a in a subsequent programme. But Dahi, as violence begins to escalate and as some of it at least appears to be more and more cold-blooded violence, what's the reaction of the international media or of the Irish media indeed? It's very difficult for the Irish media to report 
on what's happening because they are under very strict instruction. They have to obey the regulations of the Defence of the Realm Act, for example. There is also a press censor in operation until August 1919. So for any newspaper editor who writes an article which can be described as creating disaffection to the Crown forces, that newspaper can be suppressed. So the Cork Examiner, for example, in September 1919, was suppressed for carrying an advertisement for the prospectus of the Dáil Loan. And that's a serious thing for a newspaper because they lose their sales and they lose their advertising revenue. But there is quite a lot of horror at some of the tactics, particularly of the squad. If you consider the very first killing uh, by the squad uh, took place in Drumcondra, mm. uh, where a member of G Division, which investigated political crimes, G Division of the DMP, he was shot with point two two calibre bullets, which weren't big enough to kill him. And he and lingered... this is witnessed by his son, isn't it? This or is witnessed by his daughter. His so daughter. Yeah. Um, he lives very close to the St. Patrick's campus of, of DCU and he managed to crawl from Drumcondra Railway Station home to Milburn Avenue and he eventually dies uh, in September. That creates quite a lot of fear and horror because these people are fairly well known within their local communities. And effectively, the squad decapitates G Division between the summer of 1919 and early 1920, killing, in fact, the assistant commissioner of the DMP on Harcourt Street. That's Redmond. Um, that's Redmond. Mm. So it creates a measure of admiration on one level and fear on the other, I think. In terms of coverage, though, the newspapers, to some extent, are getting it in the neck from both sides, aren't they? They are. I mean, the... Loyalist newspapers have to be careful in terms of how they report on particular uh, incidents. Charles Tivy, who was the editor of the Cork Constitution, was given a very stern warning by the IRA. So it is a very difficult time for newspaper proprietors and several of them have their editions suppressed or their plant broken, particularly uh, when we move into 1920 and 1921. Brian, one of the most significant events in 1919, late on in the year, would have been the assassination attempt on on Lord French in Ashton. Now we'll be looking at that in more detail on an upcoming programme. Why was he targeted by the IRA? What happened on, on that day and why is it significant? Well, it's hugely significant because up till that point, although there'd been secret plans, you know, to perhaps assassinate British ministers and so on, nobody of that stature had been targeted by the IRA. Around 19 people had died that year altogether, which at the time was pretty shocking, but as we see in retrospect, pales in significance compared to what happens in the next year and a half. So Lord French was Lord Lieutenant. He was an Anglo-Irish man. He was born in England, but he had very strong connections with French Park in County Roscommon. Uh, ironically, one of his sisters, Charlotte Despard, is a very well-known radical supporter of Irish independence, but French was a unionist, which was very common among his class at the time. He got himself into trouble in 1940 essentially by being one of the supporters of the Curra Mutiny. Um, he was a strong supporter of unionism, supported a hard line in 1918, wanted to enforce conscription in Ireland using the military to do so. And by the time he becomes Lord Lieutenant, he feels that, you know, draconian measures are necessary. And by September, effectively in response to the deaths of the first detectives in Dublin and also a, a British soldier is killed in Fermoy, the first regular soldier to be killed. You are getting bans on the Dáil, bans on the volunteers in Sinn Féin and so on. And French is associated with this hard line in repression. So a combination of the squad and also some of the Tipperary men who were on the run, now living in Dublin, Dan Breen and so on, who are working with the squad, attempt what would have been a spectacular a major association, and again, Collins and Mulcahy are involved in this. This would have put Ireland on the front pages, certainly, you know, a very senior figure in the British establishment being shot dead. And they plan to kill him on return to the Phoenix Park. Ultimately, the ambush doesn't go as planned. A young IRA volunteer, Martin Savage, is killed. French is missed. But it certainly brings home the message that the IRA are not going to be content with shooting or you see constables or IRC constables in Tipperary, or even detectives in Dublin, that they might actually uh, target members of, of the British establishment in Ireland itself. Heather, a final word on the Republican courts. That there was an element of physical risk involved for people oh, in yeah. associating themselves with these courts, wasn't there? 
Absolutely. And probably one of the um, most interesting set of writings about the courts is by Kevin O'Shiel, who was a judge on the land courts. He published a series of articles in the Irish Times in 1966 about his time as a judge in the Doyle courts. And um, he describes, for example, taking a fake name. He describes travelling around the country, pretending to be a travelling salesman. He's selling ointment. This is the role that he has. He's selling ointment. And at one stage he describes he's taken the train from Dublin to Sligo to attend a Doyle court in Sligo. And a group of auxiliaries come in and get into the same carriage as him. And he's trying to like figure out how he manages to stay under undercover. So he decides the best thing he can do is bore them. That essentially when they try and question and figure out who he is, he'll just be really boring. So he decides that he won't kind of get away with presenting himself as a unionist. So he'll present himself as a home ruler and that he'll be the most boring home ruler possible. So he goes on at length about how, you know, wonderful home rule is and would be and etc. And they're getting very, very bored with him. And then they start asking him a few questions again. So he starts showing them the ointment because he figures that that will do it. And he starts giving them free samples of the ointment and whatever. And at that stage, they're literally like they've just had enough. He's the most boring individual they've ever met. And they get out of Carrick and Shannon, my hometown, and he carries on to Sligo um, on (laughs) Um, Dottie, we've been focusing, just in conclusion, we've been focusing much more on 1919 and the early part of the conflict in this programme and we will deal with the later parts of the conflict in far more detail as the series progresses. But just give us a, a quick preview of early 1920 and what's going to happen next, perhaps. Well, you have, I suppose, an intensification of the military campaign, which is becoming increasingly daring. Um, You have a much greater number of police being targeted and killed and a much greater number of civilians also, unfortunately, being caught in crossfire or in the wrong place uh, at the wrong time. So in terms of actual body count, that mounts rapidly, month on month, throughout 1920. And you also have a sort of a depressing cycle of an action by the the Crown Forces meeting with a counteraction by the IRA, which radicalises the general population but makes Ireland an increasingly dangerous place from 1920 onwards. And that is the story for the rest of the series. We're going to leave it there for now. Heather Laird, Dahi O'Coron and Brian Handy, thank you very much for joining us this evening. That's uh, all we've got time for in this evening's programme. Tune in next week. We'll be continuing our series on the Irish War of Independence and you can find podcasts on our website, rte.ie forward slash history. Our readers tonight were David Herlihy, Fiona Lucia McGarry, and Malcolm Adams. My thanks tonight to Cara O'Hare on sound and our researcher Liz Gillis. Thanks also to our friends at the Military Archives for the assistance that uh, they are providing with this series. The History Show is a Pegasus production for RTE. For now, from me, Miles Dungan, and producer Lorcan Clancy, goodbye and thanks for listening. (laughs) 